The most shocking thing about this case is the fact that they are alleging that this young man committed suicide. The in inconsistencies all by themselves lays out that something terribly is wrong with this picture. It just defies logic and it's an insult to this family to try to perpetrate that on them. All of this is really not making any sense. Something bad happened to Victor White III while he was in the custody of the Iberia Parish Sheriff's Office. This season's Zakia Larry Live goes where the stories are. And it's all about levity, we have a great time, and gravity. See, that's the real life, real talk, real change part. Well, recently I was in Detroit at NABJ, the National Association of Black Journalists Conference, and I sat down with two men who are part of a story that has shaken the nation. Today on Zakia Larry Live, I'm speaking to Reverend Victor White Sr. and Tony Brown, a journalist from the Louisiana area. Now, Reverend White is the father of Victor White III, affectionately known as Lil Vic. Here's the thing. Lil Vic was reported dead when in police custody, handcuffed in what is now known as the Houdini suicide. I am joined today by Reverend Victor White. Thank you, Ms. Gill. Hey, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you so much. And journalist Tony Brown. How you doing? Today we are going to give you insight into a story that will be airing this fall on ID investigation discovery called Sugartown. From the top of his left eyebrow all the way down to the bottom of his jawbone. I could see he was beating. I could see he was beating. I could see little Vic's left eye was turned inward. He had to be hit so hard that it knocked his eye inward. And I looked at the coroner. I said, what, what happened to my son? Gentlemen, this story isn't sweet at all. Well, uh, you're exactly right, and the, the irony is we're talking about a town that produces sugar, sugar cane. Hmm. Far from sweet. Pastor, you said Iberia, New Iberia and is known as they call it the as... most hottest, sweetest, and saltiest city in Louisiana. Wow. They have the manufactured sugar cane, the Tabasco sauce, and the salt mine. Wow. So that, that's what's coming out of these towns, but what has also come out is a story that has rocked the nation. But more importantly, Reverend has rocked your family. Tony has rocked you in your own way. So this is how I want to open this. I just want to say his name. Victor White III. Yes. Yes. A story that started in 2014 with a traffic stop. They saying that he was going, actually they said that he was involved in a fight at a hopping store. But you know, the video showed he had nothing to do with the fight. Okay. The officer didn't want to believe him. You know, so they, they, they was held for over 45 minutes, okay. sitting on a car handcuffed, and his friend, they let his friend go. You know, even though they knew that, hey, he wasn't involved in the fight. In some kind of way, not being involved in a fight, and now Victor White III is no longer with us today. What happened, Pastor, that led up to you connecting with Tony? Well, when I got the call that my son had been killed, and they said that he, uh, he had died, I drove down to New Iberia, which where I was living in Alexander, two hour drive, drove to two hours, got to New Iberia, then they didn't want me to see my son's body. And I questioned the uh, Louisiana State Police criminal investigator. She told me no, that my son's body was being transferred to the Louisiana Forensic Lab for autopsy. And I asked her, well, how do you know it's my son's body? She told me that they ID'd him by his state issued ID, which was suspect because his ID was still in his room. Well, at the time, so I found out where he was, so I go to the hospital. 
where they had triaged my son. So when I get to the hospital, they tell me I couldn't see him because it was under investigation. So then they kept saying that for about an hour or so, then they did decide they were going to allow me to see my son's body. But like you said, how did Tony Brown get involved? Because when they told me no, I knew they were going to set a narrative. I knew something was going on, that there was something going to happen. So I called Tony Brown at that time and said, hey, man, we got a problem at this hospital where my son is. So, Reverend, let's breathe on this a minute because you are telling us a very deep story, but you're also giving us some insight into what people feel every day and what other people, unfortunately, who find themselves in this situation can do. You said, you felt, you can tell that something was up because they would not let you see your son's body. Your next action was to call Tony to get the media involved because you knew a narrative was being shaped. Yes, ma'am. I knew that it was going to happen. We had seen it before, seen that before Trayvon Martin, you know, so I knew what was going on. It was going to try to criminalize my son, demonize my son, so I wasn't going to let that happen. And so in the midst of that, I called Tony Brown. Uh, you know, I can tell you, he was right there knowing him for quite some time, the work that he had been doing. There were other deaths that had taken place, and there was no prosecution there. So I wasn't going to allow it to happen to my son. So you knew your son had been in police custody. You knew your son had died and that was as much as you knew, and then Tony, you come on the scene. Where were you as a journalist, and how did you use journalism to join what's happening with the White family? Actually, I was on the air when he called. Okay. Uh, I have a three-hour morning show. I own a radio station in Louisiana, and he's exactly right. I put this product on the air so that we can tell our story. Uh, aside from the mainstream media on the local level, uh, in Louisiana, we have a problem. Uh, we have a problem of mass incarceration, we have a high dropout rate, and we have a corruption in the law enforcement and the entire judicial system. When Louisiana has the distinction of having the highest mass incarceration rate in the world, that's problematic. Uh, that brings shame upon law-abiding citizens in the state of Louisiana. They were simply locking too many people up, and we didn't want a little Vic to become another victim. So we had heard about the new Iberia Parish Sheriff named Louis Apple. He was a man that taught his officers how to violate civil rights, how to find the blind spots, how to illegally beat somebody up, a suspect, uh, take them for a ride, so to speak. So the things and the atrocities we heard in the 50s and the 60s during the Jim Crow era is still taking place in Louisiana, and it happened to his son. So this story has to be told. It's not a only important for the state of Louisiana, but it's also important for America because the killing of unarmed black people is taking place all over the country. And I put the show on 16 years ago because way before Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, uh, and so many others that we've seen on the national level, we got local media, even in the city where we live and where he lives, that still has not even covered this story that we've been telling for four and a half years now. So it's so problematic. You've been telling it for four and a half years, and it really is a story. Why? But you mentioned some things, Tony, when you said corruption and cover up. But let's walk through the timeline a little bit, and especially if you'll help us with this, Pastor, because these are things that have been documented. Absolutely. That you know, we'll start. You know, we know that Little Vic was taken into custody, yes. but also fast forward, the autopsy report showed that he had gunshot wounds to the chest, mm -hmm. and it said it was self-inflicted. But tell me why that's impossible. Well, well, let me tell. Let me let me t do the narrative, Pastor, and I'll let you tell the story. Here you have a young man who was searched twice, uh, put into the back of a squad car. They said allegedly they were able to find a small bag of marijuana. So you find a small bag of marijuana, you let Isaiah Lewis go, uh, you don't find anything on him. You put Little Vic in the back of a squad car, and it takes you three hours to get to the station. Now we know that Little Vic had about fifteen to sixteen hundred dollars cash in his pocket. So not only was he killed, but he was robbed and he was beaten. So he's in the back of a squad car, he gets to the police station. Uh, and they park in a very indiscreet place behind the police station in the dark. And they say when they got to the station, it became disruptive. And although they had searched him twice, read him his Miranda rights, handcuffed him, not with the linking handcuff, but one with a hinge where you can't move, he's behind his back. So they said he was able to pr produce a gun, although they searched him twice and was somehow able to shoot himself. I can't even do it. In the right side of his chest, although he is left-handed as well. See, so we call we know, it the, yeah, Houdini, the handcuffed Houdini handcuffed suicide yeah. that but to, really yeah. challenges uh, yeah. the intelligence of every normal righteous human being in the state of Louisiana. It insults, it insults our integrity.
to believe that you have a corrupt department that really killed this kid and they're, they're trying to paint it out to be something that is absolutely not. And, you know, and even with that, the thing that it, it was, that the stop was illegal, because first of all, hmm. they knew that he wasn't involved in the fight. See, so then he should have been let go. Absolutely. See, you know, normally what, they, what they're saying that they fall, found in his pocket was a small amount of marijuana. Normally they would let him go. So why didn't they? You know, that was my, one of my questions was, why, so why didn't you let him go? But as you said, see, we didn't know he was in police custody because I called. The sheriff's department, when my son called me and they said they picked him up, I called the sheriff's department that night and they told me they didn't have him in custody. So then 541 Monday morning, right, that's when my son called me back and said they said he was dead. So wait a minute. So then I called them back again. So we went back and forth and finally get someone to tell me that your son is dead. They couldn't tell me why. They refused to tell me why. And then when I get there, they still didn't tell me what happened to my son. They only let me see my son from the neck up. And again, I knew something was wrong at that point. You know, so, and, and like I said, the, the, the part that gets me is that, you know, I don't think they knew who my son was because I was a consultant for the Iberia Parish Sheriff's Department. Wow. So evidently they didn't realize that because, see, the same sheriff that had eight unexplained deaths under his watch in 10 years. So, and I wasn't gonna let my son be the ninth. So, and I guess they wouldn't, you know, and then everybody was afraid of this sheriff. So, you know, I, normally when it happened, everybody just let it go. I wasn't gonna let it go. You know, and so, and I mean, I told my wife, when they said, I said, oh no, that's not gonna happen. Yeah, I refused to, because see, when I seen my son about it, I performed my son's last right up in there, uh, in the morgue at the hospital. My son spoke to me and said, you know, don't let him get away with it. And I said, you know, in my heart, I know he, they won't get away with it. No, they will not get away with it. I will pursue this to the end. He said, don't let it go, daddy. Don't let this go. And, you know, so I seen that. I seen how they had beat my son. That was the first thing I noticed when I walked in that morgue. I seen my son face, my, his lips were busted, and had a mark. Now, I look at what the coroner did, right? That was just uh, on, on the uh, report. That's not how the mark was. You know, I, I seen what they call it. That wasn't the mark. The mark went from the top of his eyebrow all the way below his jawbone. They just put it up under his eye. He had the scar up under his eye, but they don't show the other part of it. You know, he showed that. See, so I knew then that what they were attempting to do, I wasn't going to let it go. Right. Where, as a father, where do you draw the strength from, especially you and your wife, to perform your son's last mm -hmm. rites, to also fight what's been happening, this true story, the very clear appearance injustice where do you draw that from and how do you keep from losing it all well because my son should be my legacy i am my son's legacy now you see so so the the the, the strength comes from that through my son's death i have a new mission god has given me another assignment is to go out and reach those individuals and let them know that just because we're in small town usa we do not have to bow down to corruption we don't have to law individuals because they say they're in power and they will power that they're going to have power over us you know because god didn't give us the spirit of fear but Amen. he gave a little power and of a sound mind and so therefore i know without a doubt that if i were to just sit back and allow it to happen see it's no longer just about my son see it's our son so it could be somebody else's son tomorrow. So that's what Sugar Town is about. It's going to give an individual an opportunity to see what corruption look like, but you do not have to bow down to corruption. It gives you an opportunity to see what an individual with power is like, but yet and still you don't, have to, you, don't have to, you don't have to give up and lay down to that type of power. We got to stand up against that power. So hopefully from Sugar Town that you know, the nation as a whole, or we can unite together because we could do a whole lot more united can we do, can we, that, that we can get accomplished as being separate. And that's how it is because these things happen in Ferguson, it happened in uh, Ohio, it happened in New York, Bad Rouge, Bad Rouge. Alton yes, Sterling, on and we on. go on and on. You know, we can go on and on, but see the thing is, right? Now, now, but we, we as a whole should all come together. And then we need everyone else to join with us because we understand that being victimized, but because they said my son committed suicide, they said we weren't victims. My son didn't commit suicide, he was murdered. And that's why the sheriff had a problem with me because I called it what it was. And like I told them, you know, they're afraid of him, but I'm not afraid of him because he's too much. Some of those personnel and some of those officers, they're no longer. Absolutely. And the, the, silver, lining, the silver lining about uh, tragic, uh, very tragic, as he mentioned, it could be your son, it could be anybody's son, it could be your brother, your uncle. But the silver lining is it forced the federal government to take a closer look at what was going on in New Iberia with this sheriff and his department. So not only have we had eight to nine 
questionable, unexplained deaths under this sheriff's watch while he's been a sheriff for the last 10 years. We've had nearly $3 million paid in settlements while he's been there for, uh, for excessive force. And even uh, fast forward to 2018, the White family received a settlement. Yes, well, they, they, civil, right, they settled in March, correct. That was a settlement in March. In March. Yeah, yes. and that's still going to be continuing, but but we have 10 officers that tried to turn state evidence to, to the federal government against their boss, Lewis Ackle, and did so. And we have them serving time right now. Some got three months, some got seven years. Some are in jail as we speak. Yep. But the very man who taught them how to violate black people's civil rights, how to take them for a ride, how to, what they call, nigger knocking, yep. how to go into the black community once a week and they use just to, term. absolutely, yes. Yes, to right. stir it up. Term. And the sheriff used it himself. Yes. And his, the officers testified on the federal stand as much. Mm -hmm. And this guy is still sheriff. He now, they, his deputies are doing time. Great. He was acquitted. He was the first sheriff in America to be indicted on federal charges, but he's still there. And that's problematic, not only for us in Louisiana, but for America, that this family got no recourse, no justice, not from the state, not from the local, not even from the federal government. And if the federal government can't get a crooked sheriff who's terrorizing people, who's violating the civil rights, where do we go? Where did he go? Where does his wife go? Where do we get help? So we're forced to tell this story to the world. It must be told. And, and somebody has to do something. Somebody has to do it. Thank you for using your voice, Tony, to break this story, start this conversation. Reverend, thank you, thank you. for your vision, for your tenacity, for showing us faith under fire. That's right. I appreciate you for that. And thank you both for even sharing something so deeply compelling but needed to ID investigation discovery. Let me say this real quick. He's an anomaly. I've met many parents whose children have gotten killed. They'll be on it maybe a month. He's been telling the story for four and a half years. He's organized protests. He has become a civil rights activist. Absolutely. He was forced to do that. Forced to do it. Yes. You know, and unfortunately, and I say this often, your pain often creates and drives you into your purpose. Absolutely. And so while I hate to say thank you, gentlemen, Thank you for taking up that mantle. And as a matter of fact, we will make sure to follow this story on Investigation Discovery Sugartown, the real life story of Little Vic, his dad, pastor, Tony Brown. Thank you for having us. And a community who will not stop. Sugartown, this story is profiled on ID Investigation Discovery. So thank you so much to Pastor White and Tony Brown for joining us today on Zakia Larry Live. And just for context, Sugartown comes from the fact that New Iberia is known for sugar production, but also for producing a lot of pain. And now it's time for your one minute elevate. You are not alone. We live in a country that is very divided, but there's a common thread. We all want the same thing. We want security. We want happiness. We want to feel like we belong. And so whether or not you see yourself in this story or the countless other stories just like this that are rolling out, now more than ever is the time to exercise objectivity, an open mind, compassion, and a thirst and vigor for justice. Because what happens to one of us happens to all of us. There are no more silos. So let's move forward together, understand what our neighbor is going through, and for the sake of simplicity, lend a hand and lend your voice. That's your One Minute Elevate, and this is Zakia Larry Live. You wanna do it.